Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 426 that's 426 of the Agassino Zynga show how you doing how you feeling great amazing how am I doing as best as I can I've got these anti-allergy tablets in me right in case you're listening to the podcast it's Claritin as you can hear that rattling inside my body i'm filled up with earl grey tea with a dash of honey and i'm looking on a brighter side of things if it's your first time tuning in via youtube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe and of course leave me a comment down below that'd be more than welcomed if you're listening via the podcast app a five-star review a download and a share would also be appreciated and support via patreon is welcome to via patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for that's a-g-o-s-t-a-n-h-o to get access to my one bonus episode per month sign on to patreon get involved don't delay sign on to patreon now the bonus episode is going to drop at the end of the week so make sure you get on there before that date so you can be the first to be notified at patreon.com for slash agostino patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o get on there today do not delay anyway how are you guys doing good uh, great great i'm hoping you are well wherever you may be and you're keeping your head above water um what's been going on here in the uk we've had some brief developments slight developments in the whole covid approach here um boris johnson's come out and basically laid out some sort of timeline right he's basically told us that schools aren't going back to normal until the earliest which is 8th of march which is probably a good indication as to when the rest of the economy will probably reopen then i've heard that there's supposedly meant to be a date of 22nd of february set out as when he's going to present uh, timeline of actual concrete dates for when other sectors of the economy can reopen which is the first time we've seen such a plan in maybe since the actual pandemic spread to be completely honest i don't think we've ever had like concrete dates as to okay this sector of the economy reopens you reopen you reopen on this date it's always just been dependent on the numbers dependent on what tier you are there hasn't been any like concrete goals in terms of okay if we get here you open regardless of where you're at because i think this whole tier system was getting a little bit um te- well, i won't say territorial but there was a lot of riff- riffs coming in right the, the government obviously having that tit for tat with manchester it being mostly um i guess a labor constituency it was just getting a bit weird so i'm assuming they just want to put all that to one side and just lay out a plan for the entire united kingdom and just hopefully use that as some sort of framework going forward so that should be good but i think again like i said b- aside from that you should probably wherever you are in the world you should probably try and uh seek some kind of seek some kind of joy and satisfaction and purpose outside of all that sort of stuff i think we are all aware that there's a vaccine on the market um in certain places you know they've been able to ramp up uh vaccinations pretty quickly certain people you know most people are getting vaccinated in certain countries other people not so much but we know there's light in the tunnel we're not really where we are last year there obviously are crazy numbers still in some places and people are necessarily passing away due to the you know carelessness of whatever government they're in but there is light in the tunnel we just have to hold on for as long as we can and if that's the case there is a bright future to come so it's probably it's probably um, within your best interest to pay as less of attention as you can to it now because the end is coming and when the end does come you will know about it right you don't need to be glued to the news 24 7 to find out when the end is coming so i keep reiterating in these recent podcasts i really recommend that you try your best to sort of turn off the news um stick to those closest and nearest to you entertain yourself with anything but the news whether it's a comedy a drama whatever it may be um you know interviews whatever just try and unplug yourself from that daily scourge of watching 24-hour news coverage because for the most part they're not really there to inform you and provide you with you know impartial news coverage they're there to you know scaremonger um they're there to rile you up and all this sort of stuff that you'd maybe hear from drive time radio shows that's what basically they've turned into unfortunately and even places like the bbc that are meant to be these impartial bastions of news and truth it just turns into a bit of a horror show so you know it's like in one sense boris can't do no right and never sense some people say he can't do no wrong do you know what i mean it's just too much so i recommend turning it off wherever you are and just doing anything but tuning into the news um what else i've been up getting up to aside from all that 
uh, blah, blah, blah. oh i recently watched an interview with um somebody that i'm a big fan of jordan peterson he had an interview where he sat down with douglas murray um the author of the madness of crowds one of my favorite books i read maybe in the last few years obviously jordan peterson you would know him as being the kind of foremost public intellectual from the intellectual dark web i went to go and see him talk during his tour and promo run for 12 rules for life um he's got another book coming out i think called 12 more rules for life right that's sort of like a um sequel to the original um I saw him speak in London and it was a pretty decent experience to be fair. I'm a big fan of his in general. I think he was, um, you know, unfairly miscategorized by most of sections of the media. I think if you look back on it, especially considering the time he's taken out with his illness and various health complications, you know, all the stick that Jordan Peterson got during that time was a little bit OTT, considering that his message at his core was basically demanding that men um demand more of themselves right they hold themselves up to a higher standard they seek to speak truth they seek to speak um you know to speak they seek to um yeah driving men or pursuing them pushing them to be leaders and to be you know uh breadwinners for their families to be their emotional rock and support when going through tough situation to be accountable to tell the truth as i said previously to be a good friend had to be a good colleague to entrepreneurial commit to your studies he had the sprinkling of religion in there as well right um seeking or looking at something outside of yourself and knowing that you know as much as you know there are there's much more people know out there more than you um, always remaining a student loads of really just basic stuff right and essentially the whole clean your room right there was nothing really there's nothing really that he said that you would think would justify some of the backlash and uh you know vitriol that he got from some sections of the media especially people maybe you'd say on the conventional left it was a bit ott it was a bit crazy there are stuff that you can obviously debate him on and kind of pick apart some of his ideas are probably not as um you know concrete as i would have thought especially when you look back and watch his debate with um zizek right there were obviously some, some flaws and faults in his ways of thinking but he's a human that's always going to happen but there is probably he has more good than bad points i think in general and especially considering where we are now in the world and considering what the state of the industrial dark web is you know at the moment with all the fallings out and you know controversy that kind of engulfed them since uh jordan peter had to take an extended breakout he's pretty much the i would say from my only opinion from the outside he might be the most harmless one of the group right in terms of you know what he's basically doing and what he's talking about so um again i'm a big fan of his um i recommend you check it out like i said douglas murray is also somebody that i i kind of listen to a lot i read the madness of crowds a couple of years ago and i really enjoyed it um it's probably the perfect book for you to kind of read now if you want an explanation as to what's going on in the world right now the state of politics the state of society just want to get a kind of understanding uh historical and you know somewhat contemporary understanding of what's going on definitely check out the madness of crowds by douglas murray and of course jordan peterson's 12 rules for life i'm a big fan of too so yeah um it's great to see him back man that's it basically just great to see him back um in some capacity because it was a bit touch and go for a minute there um and it's good as well to just hear it all from his mouth in it and not hear it coming again as much as i don't mind his daughter i still think you know there were a lot of genuine concerns when they come to um some of the things that michaela p Peterson has done post Jordan Peterson's, you know, um, time out of the limelight. But again, that's not my place to say. You know what I mean? That's his daughter and stuff. You've got to be a bit respectful in that regards. But regardless, good to see him back. Good to see Jordan Peterson back for sure. Um, what else is talking about? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about this. God almighty. Have you seen all the madness that's been going on with GameStop stocks, mate? Absolute pandemonium. So from what I've generally understood from the outside looking in um there's a subreddit called wall street bets and for some reason i'm not too sure what kind of spurned it but they decided to all kind of um they all decided to purposely drive up the price of gamestop stock in order to short sell it right is that short sell it or whatever that word is called in order to drive it up and then obviously get make you know insane gains on it as a kind of middle finger f you to the 
you know financial elites out there um i think it's something they always do right it's just short selling it's the thing that elon musk i think hates that um some of the people in finance do to tesla stock or they did do in the past so um this kind of subreddit basically pushed this idea forward they were picking out all these companies that are relatively dead in the water i think gamestop was one nokia was another one um amc theaters of course you know due to covid a lot of those theaters have closed and i think their business is completely stuttering due to covid so they picked a lot of businesses that basically in conventional terms are dead in the water or aren't going going anywhere anytime soon and i think maybe at the beginning of the week if i'm not mistaken gamestop might have been two digits it might have been ten dollars twenty dollars per share and then suddenly now it's kind of leapfrogged up to last i checked or something like 330 so people have been making insane gains over this time and you know there's still this adage that they're all gonna hold until the end of time until it goes to some crazy amount but essentially people have been able regular folks that are on this subreddit who kind of you know would you know uh, class themselves as financial experts in their own little realm some of them are probably people that work in the industry right i'm sure of it it's just it's a forum it's not just a place regulated to dumb dumbs i mean there's definitely going to be loads of smart people on there but essentially loads of regular folk have been able to completely change their financial circumstances during one of the worst times in history right which has been amazing to see especially in the states right um in the states where most of the people have been waiting for their stimulus check to come through there's still been no news on that front, right? Even though Joe Biden won. And you'd imagine that would be an easy win for the Democrats to do, isn't it, right? An easy goal, an easy sort of like tick on their ballot, right? An easy, an easy win, an easy trophy on their cabinet just to kind of quickly approve the stimulus checks or whatever they need to do in order to kind of get those $2,000 checks or whatever the amount is in the hands of average Americans. But no, hasn't been done yet. So it's no surprise that regular people are like, you know what, I'm going to seek whatever means that I can to make sure that that I can look after myself and secure the future of my family in any way that I can. And if it means that you're doing it and you also have the opportunity to put the middle finger up to the financial elites who have been, for the most, you know, in all intents and purposes, getting away with this same sort of bullshit for, you know, and from the beginning of time, then I definitely see why this makes sense. But the reaction to it from the establishment has been crazy. Guys on CNBC essentially crying at the fact that this is happening, warning people not to do it, um, you know, cr crying and complaining to uh, various boards to get involved and um, implement various sanctions to stop this kind of occurring again. Like some absolutely insane hand wringing has been going on from certain sections of the media and of the elites and it's definitely um an example and a reminder of just how much these people have con utter content for you and i regular people just trying to make sure that we can survive in this fucking cruel world especially during covid right covid has basically highlighted and exasperated all the individual all the indeficiencies in the system right it's basically laid to bear um the differences between the haves and the haves nots right um for us for me and you we can't we're not mobile enough to move and up sticks to different countries at, 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 you know at a whim and decide to you know change our future based on our location on an instant we have to maybe decide things you know one or one to two five years out in advance you know um employment's been taken away from you the ability to you to get an education to put your kid for an education people have opened businesses that have spluttered no support from the government no timeline of when you can get back on your feet just up to utter utter contempt and um isolation right you've kind of felt like i would imagine most people i know i felt that myself going through this but it's just been a very stark reminder that there are two realities right that exist in this world and unfortunately if you're not in the other reality where you are financially stable the whims of the world are going to affect you far more than they're going to affect these people so this whole surge to buy up all the stock and to sell it you know at a particular price in order to kind of make some returns and drive it up artificially i'm all for i'm all for so this is an article here from the bbc it says gamestop failing firm soars in value as amateurs buy stock and again this term amateurs are so insulting like i said because that wall street bets subreddit is full of people who have you know years of experience decades of experience in the financial in industry people that are probably working in the in the scene you know hiding behind the pseudonym but to suggest they're just all amateurs who have no business getting involved in stock is a real misnomer but it continues 
It says shares in the US gamer um, games company have soared more than 300,000 in the past week. The result of the fight between private and professional investors, video games, uh, bricks and mortar retailer GameStop, arguably something of a relic in the moving online, but the share price soared another 120% in Wednesday's trading on New York. Analysts blame tech savvy young day traders who they are taking on hedge funds in a conflict with generational overtones and in the phenomenon would be spreading to Europe with several stocks subject to unusual fluctuations in Wednesday trading. It's a battle between Wall Street pros and upstart investors using social media platforms as such as Reddit analysts say at the moment the upstarts have the upper hand. It is says Neil Wilson from Markets.com getting weird. We are seeing some serious funny business in some corners of the market. Will it end badly? Asked Thomas Says, managing director of Grant Hill Hedge Funds. Sure, we just don't know when. It's what's driving the GameStop price. Certainly not any good news coming from the company. GameStop described as a failing mobile base a retailer by one professional investor made a loss of 795 million in 2019 and probably several hundred more in 2020 but that's not deterred an army of social media traders with access to free and local trading platforms such as robin hood and uh tr what, what did i use i use free trade here in the uk i bought some stock as well so let's see how that goes um i think i might have bought mine at like 290 or something along those kind of lines i think so i think so um and who probably have a lot of time on their hands during lockdown they're swapping their tips and ramping up prices via Reddit's chat, um, chat read via Reddit's chat thread, Wall Street bets. But you know what? The funny thing is, um, on the time of recording, Wall Street bets has gone private. I'm not sure if the some mods or if the people behind Wall Street bets decided to take it offline, uh, during um, you know, the close of the market because it's gonna reopen again. I think what tomorrow about two thirty, right? Um, UK time, but I'm guessing nine thirty wherever you are in the US. But essentially, Wall Street bets has gone private it's gone it's finished like what is it has it been nuked as it is it pressure from the financial institutions squeezing them and basically closing um, the ability of people to communicate freely on the internet based on the financial system that's going on here or is this just uh, an inevitable end to what's going on it's flipping insane um and let's just play a video here from shamat the guy who I mentioned previously before, who's kind of uh, throwing his hat in the ring to become governor of California, decided to back up and support a lot of the people who are basically um, wanting to stick the middle finger up at these institutions. And he made some very salient points in here against a financial analyst who essentially is decrying this entire thing and calling it a bit of a ruse. But I definitely like what Shemite had to say about it. So let's play his clip here. A lot of people who believe that, you know, coming out of 2008, what happened was Wall Street took an enormous amount of risk and they left retail as the bag holder. And a lot of these kids were in grade school and high school when that happened. They lost their homes, their parents lost their jobs. And they've always wondered, like, why did those folks get bailed out for taking enormous amounts of risk and nobody helped and showed up to help my family? Exactly. And then the second video, let's go back to this one. This can is emblematic of the. Some, I, some say this is emblematic. Hey, hang on. Some say this is emblematic of of a bubble. Okay. Can I ask uh, you a question? I'm, I'm concerned about people getting hurt in what may okay, end I, up being a I part understand. of the market that's in a bubble. That, that's all. When stock when stocks trade down, okay, in moments of dislocation. I don't know if over the last three or four years you guys can throw up a chart, but there are there are times where you'd see tip to tail drawdowns of you know five, ten, fifteen percent over the course of days and weeks. What, what are we supposed to do in those situations? Just stop the market so that it can't go down? No, but this is like this is this is a unique situation. This is a you again, admit. I mean, Scott, you're getting you're getting into trying to judge, and my point is, you can't judge, so don't try. Okay, you have to understand and believe that there is so much information out there that people can be on a level playing field. This is you, of the, it's not my job to go and defend. A bunch of you know highly compensated hedge fund managers against losses and just the fact that for one time those folks lost we can bellyache and cry on national television is exactly. a joke well i mean I don't there's think a that... lot of kids hold on a second there's a lot of kids and a lot of people on wall street bets who have made money to pay off their mortgage i read about a post yesterday of a kid that was able to pay off his entire student loans and posted it that's amazing progress I read a thread before Wall Street Bets got taken offline. This lady basically was saying that she was a single mum, but had kind of come out from a very difficult relationship and got finally got a divorce, but was struggling, obviously, throughout COVID to support her family. 
and now off the back of a couple of shrewd investments and a dedication to hold and sell a few bits she's been able to essentially secure the future of her family for a couple of years to come right and this is basically for somebody who was desolate somebody who was without hope who had no option out there that was kind of ready for them to take right the government promised a stimulus check it still hasn't been delivered and they finally found a way to kind of stick the middle finger up to financial institution and take advantage of the situation right this is probably a prime time to do so considering where everyone's at home bored and twiddling their thumbs and kind of noticing and kind of realizing the in, in inequalities that exist in the world and now the financial institute is kind of up in arms and essentially they've taken if what it feels like so far they've taken wall street best offline like how insane is that this might be a bit of a consequence and another illustration as to why some people myself included were very dubious about this whole thing of like banning trump and taking off of social media because what does it end now we've seen where it ends right we've seen where it ends where it ends where the financial institution can decide who gets to speak and who gets to not speak who gets to invest and who doesn't get to invest who gets to make money who doesn't get to make money who stays rich and who decide who stays generationally poor this is essentially what they're showing us it is flipping disgusting to be fair it really is um but again it's cool to see just that this you know these sort of things are so unique for the times that we're living in this is probably one of the many benefits that come from this crazy time that we're living in during covid it's been horrible people have lost family members businesses homes relationships friendships but one of the best things to come out of this is the exposing of the you know of political institutions financial institutions and that we're seeing them laid bare and we're seeing the incompetence at the highest, highest offices of power. We're seeing how dumb and ineffective and, you know, unsympathetic these people are to the regular struggles of people like you and I. They don't care, right? They don't care. They never have cared. And this is exposing it. And if we can somehow get our own back in some way, shape or form, why not? Why not take a bunch of it? It's legal. Nothing people are doing is illegal from what I've seen for the most part. It's all above board and it's taken advantage of the very system that these guys helped to build and they profited off for years. And now the regular folk on the street are doing it and now it's become a bit of an issue. Someone mentioned before, this is like the financial French revolution. That's what it feels like. It does feel like the financial French revolution and I'm here for it. I'm here for it moving on what else do we have here talking about um finance and institutions and stuff that's happening on the web and all that good stuff have you guys been using clubhouse um i haven't to be honest um even though i was lucky enough to get approved approved right yeah because I, I joined the wait list and then i guess behind that wait list if there are people on clubhouse who are on your contact list they then get notified that you're on there and they can approve your application or something i think that's what happened to me i didn't even know that some of my cooler friends um who i've known for a few years but i don't really speak to that often were involved or kind of you know on the app early door so they're able to kind of approve me which kind of made me feel a little bit giddy i was like oh wow i got approved i'm in a cool club but then when i spent a few minutes or a few moments on the app and actually did kind of peruse around kind of got a, a feel of what it's about I kind of came away from it thinking this is a bit shit it's not something i would generally want to partake in day to day it's a social networking platform if you're not familiar um which essentially um works like twitter but instead it's all just audio and it's all kind of lives it just it doesn't live on the app it all kind of disappears at the time of recording so there are no recordings sorry of the actual conversations you join various rooms hosted by various people um concentrating on various topics you know the other day or maybe a few weeks ago there was a really cool one where they did like an audition um for the lion king and then they were able to kind of perform it live via the app where people went through the entire phrase uh, sorry the entire scenes of lion king all via this audio only platform and i guess for a certain segment of the population who likes to maybe hear the sound of their own voice like i do it probably has some sort of benefit and of course i think the early sort of like traction it received was mostly from the tech startup vc world right there's a lot of kind of interesting maybe you would say somewhat controversial conversations going on in the app and because it was behind uh closed doors and only invite only 
um a lot of people wanted in they wanted to hear what was going on there so that created a bit of you know a bit of hype and interest in the app overall which then probably led to people maybe overestimating its appeal and then of course you couple that with covid and us being locked indoors all day and wanting to communicate and con and talk to strangers for the most part right and feel like we're out and about living our lives um clubhouse was probably the closest thing to it there is an element out there that exists or there is a narrative if you listen to the joe budden podcast you you know you'll hear he'll basically say that oh you know um clubhouse and apps of that ilk add they kind of owe black people some sort of reparations because the app wasn't cool before they sort of tapped into that hip-hop urban world which is definitely there is an argument for it but to suggest that they have some sort of obligation to open up the series of investing for people that made the thing a pop isn't necessarily accurate and maybe somewhat naive in a maybe fair just world that would be a good approach but i think the world that we live in at the moment is really really naive to suggest that you will tell somebody who started their app off their own back to um, allow customers who freely decided to come on the app an opportunity to invest it's not going to happen like that but that aside and all my you know all my reservations to one side the news that kind of semi broke the internet over the week or so has been this this is courtesy of digital music news it says clubhouse confirms a massive series b valuation rumored at one billion dollars right um it says the following it says um audio driven social platform clubhouse has formally announced the completion of its series b funding round reportedly consisting of 100 million in raised capital at one billion dollar valuation clubhouse founders paul davison and rohan seth acknowledged that their company's successful series b in recent blog posts entitled welcoming more voices despite the explosive popularity growth that the invite only clubhouse has experienced since debuting on last march davison and seth emphasize that they've long uh, there's long stride without immediate results to establish a foothold in the social product space in cre in creating clubhouse they decided to give social apps one last try which is very true it's been around for a while i've kind of heard about it but it's only kind of popped in the last few months or so it's been pretty decent turnaround for them and especially considering how difficult it is to start a new social media company right a new social media app sorry i'm sure most of you guys spend your time on instagram and twitter and facebook and stuff and maybe some of you are kind of getting put off of facebook because you haven't deleted yours or you spend most time on instagram but just imagine somebody just came out of the blue and decided to make a new social media platform for you to like join right look how um uh, look at how uh, much tiktok splits opinion right in terms of who it appeals to and what people use it for it's just a very difficult space to kind of get involved in and for them to get involved in this space and do it as an audio only thing there's no visual element to clubhouse except for your avatar it's very much about the voices that speak on there so essentially you're having to hope and pray the people on the app make the app interesting as, as opposed to this kind of natural organic thing happening with images and videos and maybe editing it's basically a voice so it kind of limits the scope but they've been able to make a success and i think for the most part from what i understand it's still in in, in a quasi better beta phase they haven't opened up registrations to everybody even though they're encouraging people to recommend people and friends and i think i got like a notification on my app when i opened it the other day like oh you have four invitations right and i didn't see that before so they're obviously pushing people to acquire more users recommendations right or referrals sorry as they basically call it like that right yeah they refer to it as referrals um so there is a push to gain more users but for the most part from what i know they've just about crossed a million is it a million they're just about crossed or they're somewhere near that so it's not even that big and it's only available via ios it's not even available via android or desktop or anything so they've definitely been able to prove um that the app is viable right they've got an audience for it people are wanting to use it but in my opinion i do think it's overvalued i think a lot of this hype around clubhouse is to do with the time we're living in i think it's similar to like an app like house party right the moment the world reopens house party just dies i think every time there was a lockdown it was one of the memes that you saw on social media and um, whenever a new lockdown was announced or restrictions of us going out so all of a sudden you know a house party or zoom kind of um a zoom or a house party meme will pop up on your social media timeline zoom is a bit different because it's kind of been embraced by business it's kind of becomes a way for you to communicate with different people around the world um and less so as a thing where it just kind of only 
I feel like strength comes from the fact that we're in lockdown, which I think is what's leading to some of the clubhouse hype. I have a, and again, if, especially if you consider the people that are on there, there's a lot of like, I would say people that work in the entertainment industry, right? A lot of influencers, party people, um, artists, people that work in a creative field or somewhat, they live their lives, right? They live their lives. So that goes to inform their work or allows them to connect with people around the world, blah, 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 blah. I just can't imagine or picture a world where you're able to go to, let's say, Art Basel in Miami and you're still on Clubhouse. It just doesn't make any sense. Or you're able to go to Paris Fashion Week and you're still on Clubhouse. It doesn't make any sense. Or you're able to go to Coachella, you're still on Clubhouse. It doesn't make any sense. I don't think that is any sense in that whatsoever. Unless they kind of make it... I don't know. I just can't see it. So again, I, I'm just trying to even think. I don't even think it's a thing there. I, I do generally think it's grossly overvalued. Um, again, it's great for the founders. They're able to get in, get out and kind of get some money and move on. But I think as an app overall going forward, I don't think it's going to make a dent in terms of the social media platforms out there that exist. Um, I don't think it kind of holds a candle in terms of longevity to place apps like Snapchat, which I don't even use, but they have a, that has a lot more kind of stickability than I think a, a, a clubhouse does. So I guess if you're invested in it, it's probably great for you because you're going to get 10x your investment in some regard because the hype is just going to continue on, especially once they open up registration to everybody else. But I think ultimately it will prove to be a bit of a, um to probably flatter to deceive more so than anything going forward it'll probably end up turning up more like a meerkat then it will end up turning into more like an instagram that's just my opinion in that regard but hey what do i know next on the list what do we have here oh yeah this is good so it's because i'm you know i'm always prone i'm always prone there are times when I can be a little bit tough on people in startups because, you know, I've worked in that industry for a very long period in my career or in my kind of, um, yeah, in my career, right? I've worked mainly in startups for the most part. There have been a few stints here and there in like regular corporate jobs, but for the most part, it's been in some sort of corporate job or some sort of startup job, sorry. Um, there are a lot of charlatans that work in that industry because for the most part, you know, it attracts people who kind of think they know what they're doing. Um, there's not really any uh, barriers of entry. As long as you've got an idea and you can kind of flesh it out, build a team and ship it, you can basically have a startup. So it does kind of, you know, have a tendency to attract some dubious characters. But when there are occasions where you do come across or you do hear of somebody that's just doing great work. And I think it needs to be kind of recognized, especially when they decide to sort of hang it up. And this goes out too. Monzo founder Tom Bloomfield, who via TechCrunch has announced that he's departing Monzo because he's been struggling during the pandemic and generally kind of has to once have a bit of change in pace. And the reason why I mention is because, of course, number one, I'm a big fan of Monzo. I've been using it for like, what, two years or maybe a year. I'm not too sure, but using it for a while. Um, it's, you know, a, a bank account that mostly lives on your phone. You don't have to go into a branch or anything. Um, like I said, it's a challenger bank that kind of challenges the conventional institutions out there that exist. Um, it's just an easier thing to use, manage your money really easily with all the pots. Um, the customer service is pretty on point. And just in terms of a startup, the startup industry is fairly small. And I can really say that I've only heard good things about Tom. I've only heard good things about, you know, how Monzo is run. And when every startup I've been at, maybe with the exception of one, I've always heard somebody has either left to go to Monzo or has come from Monzo and the team at the company I was at was hired, was kind of heralding whoever had got hired as a big hire because they came from such place. Do you know what I mean? Like that's a really big um sign that you're doing great work when people that leave your company and go to other companies are like heralded as like, oh yeah, he he's he's come from where's he come from? Oh he's from Monzo. It's like wow. And or when people leave, everyone's like, wow, super jealous of you going over there. So it does say a lot about the culture and what we'll be able to create because this isn't this isn't something that happens at all startups not all startups have that culture or have that um have that status in the scene some places you know you get told you know as you're in pubs and bars having drinks with people um you know around the silicon roundabout quote unquote here in london you get to hear things through the grapevine of places that you should avoid with the you know with the longer stick that you can find you hear or read of really terrible reviews online about the working conditions there so it can be very hit and miss but when you find a founder or you hear of a founder who's doing great work 
and decides to hang it up on their own accord right recognizing the shortcomings of themselves during this period you definitely have to give them a bit of credit and use this as an example or use the opportunity to basically amplify the voice and say hey this is a good egg and he's doing good work let's give him a good send up so this is courtesy of tech crunch um it says the following Monzo founder Tom Bloomfield is departing UK Challenger Bank um, entirely at the end of the month. Bloomfield held the role as CEO until May last year when he assumed a newly created title of president and resigned from Monzo board. However, having been given the time and space to consider his long term future <clears throat> at the bank he helped create six years ago with the refreshed executive team now in place he says it's time for him to hand over the baton in a brief but candid telephone interview bloomfield also revealed that as well as being unhappy about the last couple of years as ceo when the company scaled well beyond a scrappy startup the pandemic and subsequent lockdowns exasperated pressures placed on his mental well-being he said i'm very happy to talk about what's going on with me because i don't think people do enough of which is very true so in his position usually especially in startups right um founders are lionized and idolized to kind of dizzying the dizzying heights sometimes un undeservingly so um so it can be difficult for said person to kind of come up and say hey hands up i'm really struggling i'm having a hard time and i'm not being able to handle this and it's maybe getting a bit too big for me or it's not what i expected or i don't feel like i'm adequate enough to do the job whatever your reasons are it can be very difficult because a lot of it's ego driven a lot of it's you know showing off how you know you know how big of a company you can build there's a lot of bragging about how big you're scaling how much you're making all this sort of stuff so to be this open and honest about it is definitely a credit to him it continues he said i stopped my role probably about two years ago he says um as we grew from a scrappy startup that was iterating and building um stuff people really love into a really important uk bank i'm not saying that one is better than the other uh, it's just that the things i enjoy in life is working with small groups of passionate people to start and grow stuff from scratch and create something customers love and i think that's really valuable skill but also taking on a bank that's three or four million customers turning it over into 10 to 20 million customer bank and getting profitability and ipoing i think those are huge exciting challenges just honestly not ones i found that i was interested in or particularly good at which is something that you hear a lot of founders do well, you hear a lot of founders go through, right? You heard the Instagram guys, a few people, right? It's very difficult to, I guess, enjoy the job I'd imagine. Because even for myself, I know, let me talk for myself as an employee. When I go to startups, most startups I've been at, the best times have always been when you're like plucky and you're under 100 employees, right? And you're basically doing seven jobs and you sometimes have to stay in until like 10 p.m. You come in sometimes on weekends, Um and it's just you're kind of all aiming for this common goal right because you believe in this vision this grand vision or plan that this app or service has to disrupt whatever market that you're in or to revolutionize this this or whatever sometimes it could be short sighted sometimes it could be a little bit naive and gleeful um but that kind of hope and that drive that you all have collectively um is what makes the experience that much worse that much more worthwhile and for somebody like myself right coming in with maybe not much experience it's a great place to kind of go and turbocharge your cv right turbocharge your experience levels you learn probably more in the space of a month than you would do working a very specific um, niche role in a corporate company somewhere with a guaranteed salary obviously there's a risk at startups where you could start one minute working for a company and next minute it goes under right in, in record fashion but you know with high risk comes high reward so it definitely can pay off but i can definitely understand from so imagine that but then when it suddenly then blows up and it becomes a big thing or you get more funding and the company needs to justify the funding by hiring more people moving offices uh you know doing swanky presentations and guerrilla marketing campaigns that just look like a whole bunch of waste of money it then turns into a whole other thing and then the pressures come to you know make sure that you're justifying the salary that you're achieving it just becomes weird and doesn't it's not fun anymore and i think most people can agree with that right the the pre 200 employee market a startup is probably magical right it's probably hard to even bottle it up and ship it away somewhere but once you kind of blow up it's very difficult and i guess even for a founder it must be even harder right that you kind of you know made up this idea or this service or this app on the back of a 
beer mat somewhere you put together a bit of money that you had you risked maybe your you know your life savings you remortgage your house a couple more times and you put it all on this app and it starts up and it finally starts to pick up some steam after a whole time of just nonsense and nothingness and then suddenly and then that that suddenly becomes your calling right you found the thing that you need to do in life and then suddenly it changes because you decided to accept more money or you decided to grow it more with some good intentions right with some good ideas in mind but it does it turns into something that you wasn't really expecting it to be it can be it can, i bet it's a mindfuck i bet it's a mindfuck just kind of wrangle like what is this like and you maybe kind of blame yourself or put yourself in the position that you are in now but you know it's not really your fault because this is the only way to grow the company and allow yourself to you know have a bigger team to help out on certain things and maybe certain features and services couldn't have been launched without this team and you secure the future of other people in your company there's loads of conflicting things that must come in your head but it definitely must be super weird to kind of go through that you know from beginning to end or beginning to you know post ipo and then to kind of fall out of love with what you made it must be super hard to kind of uh, wrestle and come to grips with continues it says in early 2019 after realizing he was doing too much and not enjoying it bloomfield began talking to the monzo investor um Elin burbage is it Elin Bur burbide burbage or burbage of passion capital and monzo chair gary hoffman about changing roles and how he needed more time or need help sorry then he says covid just exasperates things a period when monzo also had to cut staff shutter his la offices and raise uh bridge funding in a highly publicized down round so this is something again you don't hear enough about right this is i guess if it's not COVID and it's just, you know, maybe the business isn't going as well. And usually there are some occasions where the, the founder can be somewhat detached and emotionally remove themselves from feeling any kind of sorrow or sympathy for the situation because, you know, you've got to run a business. But it is quite admirable to see that it was her and him that he had to kind of be at the masthead and at the you know top of the chair table and making some tough decisions about staff cuts and closing certain offices and you know the the damages because i remember at the start of covid there was loads of rumors going around that supposedly mondo was going to shut down people were messaging each other on my some some of my little startup group chats and telling people to take their money out of their monster accounts because um they weren't gonna see the end of the year right there was some mad things going so i can only imagine what it must have been like behind the scenes in the actual company itself he continued, said, I said, I think for a lot of people in the world and you and I have spoken about this, going through a pandemic, going through lockdown and isolation involved in that has an impact on someone's mental health. I don't think it's, um, I don't think I was any different. So it was really struggling. I had a really pro supportive executive team around me and a really supportive set of investors on board. And I was truly grateful that I put my hand up and said, I need help. And they were super receptive to that, which again, you know, it's something that you probably want to receive a lot of sympathy from, from regular folk, because, you know, they think, oh, he's got money. Why should he care? He should be all right. But again running those sort of companies um it does take a lot of, it does take its toll on your mentor i'd assume but yeah um a lot more there in the interview to speak about you can check out um he says i think what he said about the future he's looking just to take some time away um and just look at some other projects but again um credit to tom bloomfield uh, founder of Monzo stepping away you know on top and deciding to pursue other things and handing over the reins of Monzo to people that he thinks can do the job better and just in general for creating a company and an app that is probably going to you know far surpass his um, involvement in it directly and it's going to be a legacy thing that's going to be you know an example to others and also just creating a working environment that kind of makes people envious of people that have a job there that's crazy and it's a thing startup that was created six or so years ago has become a place where people are dying to work at um so again credit to him and hopefully wish him in the best for the future what else do we have here what else do we have here what else do we have here? Oh, that's hurting. Okay, let's move on. Okay, cool. Let's get to this. Because I want to go to the end. Oh, 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 oh. This is it. It's a bit of a cheat there. A bit of a cheat. A bit of a cheat. So, so um, I've been thinking a bit more about the play gray thing, right? And um, my, my opinion on it just keeps moving and shifting and changing a bit, you know say la vie because i like to think about these things a bit deeply and not just give my knee-jerk opinion around it but i was kind of thinking a lot about the interview with bicep and independent the other day that i mentioned in the podcast right then they made obviously a good point in terms of 
um, the issue isn't the playgrounds because they're obviously going to happen. The issue mostly is that for the most part, all the footage that we've seen of these parties are taking place in various dubious locations around the world where certain governments are probably not taking the, are not probably applying the precautions that are needed in order to look after the populace. And these years are obviously taking advantage of it as all the promoters. But they're obviously, for the most part, the footage we've seen, it always features people you would maybe deem to be on the more affluent end of the DJing pay schedule or the DJing pace scale and I really hate to mention it because I do think it's a bit yucky when other people sort of like look up people's pockets and say hey why do you need that when you have this and stuff I just think it just comes across a bit gross but there's no denying that it is odd that the people who you would think would be the ones that get paid the most in terms of DJing fees and brand sponsorships and all that malarkey are the ones that are trying their best to ensure that they're playing every playgrave that they can get a hand on in order to make sure they're in front of a crowd. Because you'd imagine a lot of these people don't need to, I don't say don't need to be, but it's not as if being in front of a crowd is foreign to them. It's not as if they're like a plucky um, underground DJ who is kind of desperate to get in front of a crowd because it's been a year that they haven't been you know surrounded by strangers in a dark basement rave somewhere these are people who play week in week out sometimes you know free gigs in one week free free gigs on one day in various locations across europe so taking some time away from it especially for a short period of time in comparison to their entire career because dj you can do until you know way 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 into your old age right it's not something that requires um your body to be uh, a young sprightly gentleman or madame in order for you to continue doing a career so it's not as if it's like the time out the two years or one year that we've kind of been living in some sort of lockdown is going to negative affect their career in any meaningful way so it's just curious that this is happening continually especially with the people that occupy the top end and one big example of this is solomon right somebody who i'm a big fan of somebody who i think um approaches the art of DJing in a very business sort of professional relentless fashion right he's known as the king of the after party um he's known of he's known to play you know 10 hour sets in a club and then play the after party for another six hours you know non-stop uh no no sitting down no look of tightness about him whatsoever just going for it continually right and he's one of the rare ones as well in that kind of business techno group where he's actually a proficient um dj right he's somebody who a lot of people would think has good taste right there are probably sets of his that you could listen to and pl pick out a couple of the tunes that you would probably play in your set right regardless of what genre you play i'd imagine right i'd imagine maybe objectively you can objectively i think a lot of people would say he's a good dj right so he occupies that weird space where he's respected by you know the djs djs and also respected by people who you know spend their times on private jets and wearing uh dc10 merch right he's probably respected by those two crowds so it's just curious to see that he's one of the people again who's playing these dubious skeptical parties in tulum that may or may not be funded by cartels and may or may not be adding to the you know surge in covid cases and deaths all across mexico and this is another example of it where it looks like he's playing in some sort of villa it looks like right because a lot of these clips that we're seeing now they don't look like they're taking place in clubs so i'm assuming nightclubs aren't open in the conventional sense so they're having to do a lot of these raves in airbnbs and villas and penthouses and private you know uh households whatever it may be and um yeah uh, it's just odd again like it's just odd considering that he's one of the top paid djs in the scene if you believe what you read online um i think someone says something along the lines of uh Masio plex was booked to play i think i might have seen this on reddit Masio plex was paid to book at um so particularly the pinch of salt but supposedly Masio plex when he was booked to play at junction two one of the previous years he was paid anywhere between I'm going to say they say 20 to 50 grand, right? Which is a quite a big scale, but let's say 30 to 50. If you get paid 30 to 50 grand to pay a set in a normal a normal time, what do you think your lowest they're going to take during a pandemic is going to be? Five to 10 grand, maybe, right? So there's more time that you spent making 50, or let's say the average of 30 grand per set, and you play two sets per day, 
that's a lot of scrunch. That's a lot of it's a lot of dough, right? A lot, and you probably a, a lot of dough that would probably go far in a lot of countries, especially the ones that these guys tend to live in, right? There's rarely you hear of DJs say that they live in Paris or Sweden or even London, right? They usually pick places that are fairly affordable, where your money can maybe travel and go a bit longer than where it might do in more expensive cities. So why do they need to fly to Tulum to go and play these parties? Is it just because they want to get in front of a crowd or is it generally because they need the money? And if they do generally need the money, then what have they did with, what did they do with all the other fees that they got paid playing all these other places? Even when you include the agency's um, rates that they're taking out of it, or what you're paying your manager, you're still getting left with, you know, a sizable amount from just playing a couple of records or just playing like an hour or two sets, right, in places. And that's also your way to imagine outside of Solomon before I play the video outside of Solomon a lot of these people play conventional club sets and even in festivals right one to two hours if that Solomon's probably the exception he plays pretty much he plays pretty much I think minimum of four hours and up but most of these people I'm going to feature on this or I'm going to mention they usually just play an hour or two hours of the set right most of the music they're playing is fairly generic and disposable and very very forgettable but this is what's driving them to travel half halfway around the world to play these weird places and again maybe it's not their fault it's mostly the fault of the government maybe it's mostly the fault of people that are attending the parties in the first place who knows it's just interesting and weird to think that somebody of his status and financial earning power needs to play a rave in tulum during his time but hey what do i know let's play the video <laughs> This is courtesy of Business Tessional, by the way, on Twitter, you're welcome to find them. get me wrong it looks fun because it's, it's always fun to see people partying and having a good time but pff, my word my word <laughs> So again, like I said, who knows what is, uh, I, I, that's that's why I kind of kind of pose the question, what do you guys think is driving some of this, uh, this desire for these people who are, you know, again, like I say, who operate at the highest uh, point in terms of earning potential in the dance music scene as DJs, what is this tendency for them to go to play at these playgraves? Because again, like I said, with the exception of that one rave in New Year's Day in Ukraine, that Sally C, Freddie K, and a few other people went to play that, I've not really seen many other raves that have happened past summer where people that you would think would generally need the money have played at. There are obviously they do exist. I'm sure they've have done behind the scenes. I'm, I've heard of people doing Zoom private corporate events. I've heard of people doing stuff behind closed doors in bunkers. I know it's happening, but the ones that we see getting covered for the most part are only the bigger kind of glitzier DJ Maggie mix mag type of people that are playing and obviously the interesting part of it also on top of it is that most of the big publications aren't covering this right your mix mags and DJ mags and resident advisor they're not covering this and the reason why most of the reason if you think deeply about this is that if you check some of the booking information of some of these people they're all kind of um on the same rosters right i think the one group is called liaisons or something like that right and a lot of these same people that are featured on business test and a few other places they're all signed to the same agency so is this some sort of weird collusion that these uh dance music publications that speak about everything else in the culture aren't willing to speak about 
parts prominent people in the industry essentially adding to um the misery and the pain in various parts of the world by playing these raves in places that they probably shouldn't be at and taking advantage of lackadaisical government governmental control why wouldn't they cover it and they're not which is a really really curious and dubious thing to see they just refuse to cover it they just kind of pretend it's not happening like the whole daniel wang and peggy goo situation what actual big dance music publication do you see cover it none zero right because i didn't want to get involved because you know she signed to a certain agency who signed to a certain label and all this sort of stuff and you don't want to upset that place because you won't get able to be able you won't be able to feature this person or get an interview it's really really odd and very very odd, strange and bizarre and again like i said the only people that it seems to benefit are the people that operate at the top end of the scale so why do you think this is happening why do you think someone like a solomon needs to go to a tolum to go and play when he plays normal festivals and raves pre-covid and he gets paid anywhere between 30 to 50k um to play an event of course he's not getting that money clean in his pocket he has to pay expenses he's got a family well this is it well whatever else make your make your stipulations and again like i said i feel disgusting even mentioning someone else's earning but it is a, a, a valid question to ask isn't it like why is it only the more affluent DJs are the ones playing these faves and not the ones who actually need it. What's actually happening there? Is it because they just have an insustainable urge to be in front of a crowd and they don't want to be forgotten? They don't want to be, um, they want to kind of make sure that they're somewhat quote unquote relevant. What is driving this? What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your opinion regarding it. What else is happening here? Let's move on. We've heard that. We've seen this. Um, oh yeah, cool. Let's talk about this. So this is um, courtesy of the Shade Borough. Um, I guess we have some development on the whole Octavian um, abuse of his ex-girlfriend. Alleged, of course. Put that in there just in case someone decides to come after me. Um, so... According to the Shade Borough, uh, Shade Borough, sorry, Octavian's ex-girlfriend Hannah says she was offered twenty thousand to never speak on their relationship again, and this is courtesy of a documentary that she filmed for the BBC. Um, so let's read the caption here. It says the following: uh, Residents last year, Octavian's ex-girlfriend Hannah detailed her experience of physical and emotional abuse while in a relationship with Octavian. She also shared the graphic images and shows injuries. She has now appeared in a BBC documentary titled "Music Dirty: Music Secrets" and revealed. Octavian's lawyer offered 20,000 in an attempt to silence her from not speaking out. The full story is on shadow.com. So, um, this shouldn't be much of a surprise. I think she mentioned it in some passing or alluded to the fact, or maybe put it down on paper, not too sure, but this isn't that surprising. We knew this was happening. We knew that, um, there was obviously a harem of enablers and uh, excuse makers and turning of the blind eyes um, or looking the other way that were involved in this. We know that, you know, for the most part, if you've read any sort of stories and um, accounts of abuse, especially in an industry such as music, you'd know that rarely, if ever, do things happen in isolation and rarely, if ever, do things happen in private and in secret that no one knows about. Somebody has heard or has been made Made aware of something that's been happening untoward and then of course it's up to that person and the close circle to put that person in check but it's rarely ever comes a point where you hear of a label proactively going and taking an artist and play taking him to one side and saying hey you can't do x y and z because it's going to damage your career and it's effectively hurting somebody that you allegedly love it's usually the close team of that person that needs to kind of step in and do that but most of the time they don't do that either because they don't want to upset the apple cart they don't want to get involved um the artists themselves don't are probably won't going to listen they just want to turn a blind eye because loads of other people are doing it whatever reasons it wasn't a surprise to hear that somebody in Octavian's team was obviously trying to silence the girl and buy her out of her accusation and obviously luckily for her and for I guess for this industry in general she kind of rejected that and was able to kind of go through with the charges and again like I said in other cases there is no winner here right no one wins from this um 
from what I gather and from what she said from the clips I have seen, they were in an actual committed relationship. They kind of fell over head over heels with each other. She was obviously envisioning herself spending a long time with this guy. He obviously met her and thought she was blessed. Um, and then suddenly, you know, over a short period of time, the whole relationship disintegrated so much so that he's losing his entire career. She's now been, I wouldn't say permanently branded as a victim, but no one likes to be only known as a victim. You want to be known as more than that. You have more to offer to the world. And you have obviously a certain segment of Octavian's fan base are going to be making it their mission to make her life a living hell. So in the end, it really is disappointing because nobody ends up really winning. And the people who could have stopped it, who could have made sure that this didn't continue, were the label, right? They could have stepped in when this was happening at the time and rescued the situation in some regard, but they don't do that. They enable it. And that's what I've said previously when it comes to other of these cases. Um, let's say Octavian is a monster. Let's say he is a bad guy and there's no road back for redemption for him. Let's say that is true, which I don't believe. I think there's always a road back to redemption, but let's say that is true. If that is true, but I still believe that um, it, it's not, it doesn't happen. It's not just the fault of that one person, right? There's a group of people who turn a blind eye, who purposely refuse to get involved. And then as soon as it gets too much, they then just start pointing their fingers and say, no, it's just you. You did this by yourself. It's like, yeah, maybe. But you're meant to be my team. You're meant to be people are looking after me. You're meant to be supporting the situation and acting as a big brother, whatever it may be called, the big bro, loads of family, I love you. All these sort of platitudes get thrown around the place. But whenever somebody's in actual trouble and they need actual help, those people go missing. And that is essentially what ends up happening. Because I'm sure if you're Octavian, he's fairly lonely now. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people like have um, gathered around this girl, Hannah, and I'm sure she's got a great support system in her family. And, you know, strangers are probably sending her messages every other day and making sure she's okay and all this sort of stuff. But if you're Octavian, that group of people that you used to hang, hang, hang around with, the group of people that used to hit you up all the time about guest list and wanting to meet up in certain places and all the branding deals and people, all these companies, I'm sure those communications have dried up so he's all on his own do you know what I mean so that's the really distressing part of this whole thing um uh, in an industry that basically takes advantage and exploits and then abandons artists when they kind of hit a brick wall and they're going through some tough times is now the same industry that's effectively negatively affected this young lady's life and left her with emotional scars that'll take a very very long time to heal so this is um from shade borough play some clips from the documentary itself and then we can end the show House party, some random house party that I ended up. I actually lost all my friends. She's talking about how she met him. And yeah, we just started chatting. But a lot of fun. Just our friend groups kind of meshed. And then um, I think a year after we were kind of just sleeping together, he asked me to be his girlfriend. More than what? They moved in together and bought a puppy. By summer 2019, Hannah was pregnant. She says Octavian didn't want the baby so she had an abortion. She says he attacked her the same day. God, I just wanted to like be held and feel like I hadn't just done something really, really horrible. And he kind of pushed me onto the floor, like grabbed me by my face and threw me backwards, kicked me, threw me into the balcony door. There was like a chunk out of my hand that ripped and um, my lip was burst and I had just several bruises. Jesus Christ. And I think if anybody, and imagine, right, that at the time that she first put these allegations out, some people from her team, his team, were denying it, calling her a liar, basically insinuating that she was making it all up. He was obviously spinning out of control and saying all types of nonsense, but, you know, put it to one side because he's obviously got his own demons he was suffering from. But there's a lot of people in the team that were making excuses for this sort of behavior. And to suggest that this was only something that came to light when she made the allegations is insane. There's no way that no one else would have known about this. But they purposely decided to turn a blind eye that didn't step in because he was making them the money at the time. And it was all good times, right? It was all happy, happy as Larry. Everyone was going to the shows, attending these freaking tours, going to the great festivals, going to get interviewed by big stations and magazines and shit. And behind the scenes, this girl was going for absolute hell. Crazy. Then she heard from Octavian's lawyers. I got an email from his lawyer with a uh, NDA offering me 20,000 pounds to never speak on anything that's happened in our relationship, 
never tell any publications, never tell any family, never tell any friends, never say anything bad about Octavian or his career or anything at all, really. Delete. Oh, and by the way, don't don't be um don't be fooled. That lawyer was hired by the record label. That's the same lawyer that they give you to negotiate your three sixty deal, who then takes a chunk out of that deal. Right? It's the same Fugazi um scammy uh routine that they run. So that same lawyer that the record label hired was the same one that was offering her hush money. I would say. That's my assumption. I don't know any information, it's all alleged, but that's what I would guess. That's how scummy and disgusting the music industry and just the entertainment industry in general is. Horrendous. And imagine at the end of this, right, the victim was a young lady. The all photos, all evidence, all videos. It just all felt wrong. I didn't want to sign it. I said I'm not going to sign it. I've seen evidence Octavian's music management were involved. They deny it, and sources suggest they believed his side of the story. Of course Hannah they thinks did. Octavian's career just came first. And I think most people, especially myself being an Octavian fan, you can't deny that you did recognise the difference in him over the years, over the you know the months, then when he kind of started to pop. And it happens so often, right, with people that I've kind of followed over the years, and it's something that's a real recurring thing. The moment they sort of get that initial buzz and pop and kind of go quote unquote pop and get successful and the song kind of goes into radio radio rotation and they get certain looks on certain stations and YouTube channels and shows and brand deals, you can slowly see the kind of musical output start to dwindle somewhat because, you know, naturally those kind of um, um, deals and sponsorships outside of it are taking up more of your time. But then there are those kind of great artists who are able to kind of rein that back in, put those to one side a little bit and then recommit to the music. They're usually a bit of a blip, right? They pop, they go big, they get the corporate sponsorship, the music kind of dips and then they kind of pull it back in again, they come back up again, the quality. But I did recognize a gradual decline in the quality of Octavian's music the more time went on. And then of course, you know, you couldn't take your eye off the fact that he physically looked different. He physically looked like he was probably indulging in all the um, excesses and distractions that you would get from being a young young fairly affluent um newly minted rapper and singer in the uk again you have to imagine this isn't america right if you're a star in here you basically are a star you're basically a big one right because there's not many other people to really listen to so that obviously changes things so um this wasn't a surprise so if we could see as fans right just fans who had no access no information we didn't we weren't around him in the studio and shit we didn't hear him speaking every day we just saw what we just saw whatever content he put out there and we recognized it imagine his label who's who are there with him every single day representative people that work with him closely who are traveling with him day in day out come on they just wanted to keep me quiet and make sure that it doesn't affect money or his tarnish his reputation bloody hell Around the same time, some of the tracks Octavian was making. Then she heard from Octavian's lawyers. Sony's Black Butter Records seemed to describe how he might hurt women. There's a song. This sort of stuff I've got no point. I've got no real time for. I think you should be. I should be allowed to say whatever the hell they want on a track. Freedom of speech should exist in music, and it should always be like that. I think if you want to start placing people's language, did you have to apply that to all forms of or to all genres of that exist? I feel like whenever this conversation does arise, it only seems to ever come into question whenever speaking about quasi quote unquote urban hip hop rap music. It never gets applied to hip. It never gets applied to pop metal even even um you know whatever else music that exists out there that people don't apply this stuff to that's where it can sometimes get annoying and it can seem like a little bit of an attack specifically on the black community if you want to apply these draconian somewhat outdated um stipulations of what people can say or not on a track then it has to be applied to the music industry at large and of course that's going to negatively affect the quality of the music but hey 
oh, it is what it is. And in general, too, if you want to catch monsters and you want to catch bad guys and bad actors, you don't need to dissect their lyrics. Their actions are going to speak much louder than their words on the track. And he's basically proved it, right? He's he's probably more of a piece of shit that, that in person than he is on what he's saying on the track. I'm sure her hearing these bars and them, it may be alluding to the situation that they're going through was probably hurtful. But I'm sure what he actually did to her physically and mentally in real life was probably a lot more than hearing thousands of people scream this song that may or may not be been described about you i would say i'm called my head he would reference these songs in the studio as the one about killing hannah and okay that's a, <laughs> I mean, i'll take back what i said there. <laughs> he, calls it sicko, man. And he laughs and he gets celebrated for it just like thousands of fans would sing it to him at his shows and they were literally singing about things that were happening to me and ironically, that's his best song. So it was a very clear statement to say, you're not being made aware that this is what your artist has been doing. This is the music that he's making about what he's doing. She sent the letter months before she went public with the same allegations. But Black Butter didn't drop Octavian back then. Of when course I asked they didn't. Why, they say they were not provided with evidence at this time and were assured by Octavian and his management that the claims weren't true. You're going to stop hitting her, right? Yeah, yeah I'm going to stop. All right, cool. Anyway, so what, what are you going to go studio next? It's like these labels, man. <laughs> Absolute pieces of shit, aren't they? For both people, right? When he's going through all this mess and he needs their help the most, they drop him. When he's actually abusing her and they can actually bring it back in and save the life of somebody, right? A, a young lady who's being abused, they don't do anything. Disgusting. Two weeks later, Hannah was back with Octavian. She withdrew her complaint and told them to ignore the letter. Black Butter say it was therefore reasonable to assume that they were dealing with their relationship. Look what they're hiding behind. Today, Hannah says she feels duped. And he said, I just want to speak to you once face to face. I thought maybe I'll get some kind of apology, closure. I went to London and he was showing me all these paintings he'd been doing to deal with his anger management that he's doing. So it was a very clear therapy. He's booking couples therapy for us. He was so gentle, so sincere, so compassionate. I'm, I don't know how he could act this good. It was, it felt so real how he... Which probably explains why, I think a lot of people are probably thinking like, why is she, because it's very rare that you see an ex-partner or somebody in an abusive relationship that would go the entire way you know kind of pursuing charges and putting out all the information the pictures the detailed accounts of the issues the videos right usually they just want to you know um have some sort of break and closure whether it's monetarily or just putting their story out one time and moving on but she seemed to have really gone out of and especially if you remember when she dropped the allegation i'm pretty sure she dropped the story on the day that he was meant to announce the album or release the album one or the other right so she's obviously gone out of her way to just destroy his career and a lot of people are thinking like why is this happening why is she so um vengeful and really making her mission to bury the guy and this is why he obviously um was somehow manipulative and was able to kind of convince her that he had changed and he made all the efforts and did all the things that you would imagine um somebody who feels repentful about what they've done and wants to make amends and then i think she felt so betrayed and felt so duped and felt so um embarrassed and made a fool of that she would kind of declare that day if he fucks up again, I'm going to end him. And I think that's what basically happened for the most part, if you want a reason. Because it is, honestly, I, I, from stuff I've seen, you don't really see, especially women in this situation, young ladies go this entire way with it. It sometimes gets a bit too much. They just want to kind of deal with, you know, kind of deal with it behind closed doors, reach a settlement, work something. But the reason why she's doing this is because he, he himself turned her back on her in a really, really dark way. And... You know, this is his bed. He has to lay in it now, and this is a consequence of his face. His career has been ruined. His name has been tarnished. Um, you know, he was not really that successful for a long period of time. So his family hasn't even been able to enjoy the fruits and the riches of his success for that long, right? He, look how many people have been affected by his kind of reckless behavior. Not only her, but everyone else within his orbit, right? Now his label is getting besmirched. Managers, I saw people attacking his ex flatmate that he was living with. Like loads of people have basically become collateral dam collateral damage off the back of his reckless and somewhat um you know 
batshit crazy behavior really changed and i fell for it in september let's go to you people like this in the music industry i want people to really think about who whose pockets they're putting money into do you think the industry is responsible for what happened yes they're not responsible for what happened, but they're responsible for letting it continue to a margin and a scale. Of course. That's left me pretty traumatized and scarred for the rest of my life. Had someone ever told him, even once, what you're doing is wrong, we wouldn't be where we are. They would rather continue on their way to making him a star and making money from him. Damaging, damaging stuff, and you know, most likely his career is done for now. I still think there maybe should be a route for redemption in some way, shape, or form. It should always exist for most people. I think there are some crimes that are inexcusable and probably should remove you from ever having a possibility of making a living, uh, being an entertainer of some sort, right? They, those crimes do exist. I don't have to mention them aloud, but you know what I'm talking about. But I do think there is an opportunity for redemption. But of course, this only comes when you're able to acknowledge the wrong that you've done. You're able to kind of make amends with the people that you've hurt the most. And I think hiding behind album rollouts and your label and painting somebody as a liar just isn't going to help in it. This whole situation, how he dealt with it was really crap. Um, and effectively, he's only gone and really ruined his own career himself. He has no one else to blame, really, in this regard. And um, I guess it's kind of brave of the girl to go out and speak about this in public. It hopefully helps other people in the industry who have maybe suffered from the same thing to come forward. But the real thing that you'd want from to come from this is that this doesn't happen again right that the industry takes knowledge um so it acknowledges its wrongs and what it kind of enabled and the behavior it lets people get away with so that other young ladies in the industry that come in open-eyed and wanting just to take part and fell in love and all this sort of shit don't get you know steamrolled and basically discarded um in favor of an artist and his career because this could have ended in a really tragic way, right? It could have ended far worse than how it's ended, really. He's lost his career. She's obviously went for a really bad relationship. And, in, in, you know, if you kind of, you know, zoom out, it's not that bad. But it could be much worse. It could be much worse. Um, again, um, check it out. I guess it's on BBC. It's called Music's Dirty Secrets um, documentary. I'm sure you'll be able to find it on YouTube when somebody uploads it later. But, yeah, that's that. So that's been the Exynos Singer Show, episode number 426. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. If you're tuning in via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening on the podcast app for the first time, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. And of course, support via Patreon is always more than welcome. Please support me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash Agostino. You get one bonus show per month on there, which is a bit more X-rated, a few more dicier, racier subjects I'm going to be speaking about. The first episode goes out this week, end of this week's Make sure you sign up on patreon.com for just agostino patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o get involved don't delay get involved today but until then see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace